If there's anything we find encouraging about the future of housing affordability, it's that the Yes in My Backyard pro-housing movement crosses political and ideological lines. This week, three bills making big changes in how Montana cities handle zoning passed through the House with broad margins and bipartisan support. Unfortunately, the Not in My Backyard activists who oppose housing and neighborhood change are also pretty diverse politically. I have seen a city of renters, and it's terrible. My constituents did not elect me to line the pockets of developers, to gut zoning regulations, and ignore the wishes of our cities and towns. In this video, we're going to cover pro-housing and anti-housing positions from four different political perspectives. The environmentalist case for Yimbyism is that denser development is just better for the environment. It sounds counterintuitive given the trope of cities as concrete jungles, but building more compactly and building up are very effective strategies for paving over less forests, farmland, and otherwise ecologically valuable land. If Brooklyn had the density of Staten Island, it would take up almost five times more land than it currently does. Letting people live closer to things makes walking, cycling, and transit more practical, allowing them to leave cars for trips where they're really needed. Motor vehicles spew all sorts of things into the air that give people cancer, respiratory diseases, and other health problems, on top of contributing to climate change. One study from California found that urban infill development, allowing more homes where people already live, is one of the best strategies to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. Environmentalism gets housing wrong when it takes an extremely local perspective and ignores the bigger picture. Ann Arbor, Michigan, recently rezoned a commercial corridor notable for its oceanic parking lots to allow high-density housing with the goal of creating a more downtown-style environment that's more pedestrian-friendly and less car-centric. One counselor opposed the changes. The craze to fill our city with new residents overlooks the fact that every person we bring here brings their carbon footprint. This makes no sense. Carbon doesn't get counted according to city boundaries, and people moving to a higher density, less car-centric neighborhood are going to have a lower carbon lifestyle on average. Another environmentalism hazard is focusing too much on aesthetics and seeing green things, which can lead someone to think that the monoculture, manicured lawns of suburbia are the pinnacle of environmentalism. Even more urban environmentalists are not immune to prioritizing aesthetics over function. A former city councillor in Ottawa recently declared that no building should be higher than the highest tree, which he declared to be six stories. The conservative case for Yimbyism is that dense, mixed-use neighborhoods are just the traditional way that cities and towns were built for as long as human settlements existed, until the radical suburban experiment of top-down planning and one-size-fits-all approaches to housing. Neighborhoods built before modern zoning were based on organic growth according to the needs of individuals and households. So, for example, if your retired parents are getting older, you can build a secondary suite in your backyard for them. This is not legal on most land in most cities under modern zoning. Taller apartment buildings might or might not be for you, but they're only financially viable in a city where there's demand and need for them. Traditional mixed-use main streets are more conducive to smaller and more local businesses, and more traditional compact urban forms allow children more independence and physical activity without needing to be driven everywhere. Conservatism gets housing and density wrong when it turns exclusionary. Modern housing regulations almost always prioritize larger homes that take more land and cost more money. And that's appealing to a lot of people as a method of government-enforced economic segregation. Why do we want a bunch of poor people in Alexandria anyway? No one does except city council, so they can tax the property and live their progressive dream of turning us into a mini San Francisco. This exclusionary instinct often targets renters. And I've seen cities of renters, and it's ugly, it's unkept, it's noisy, strangers, schools, issues. The whole thing sounds to me as if it is absurd. It sounds like a, a socialist kind of idea, and I'm not a name caller. If I sound like a NIMBY, too bad, because I care about me my neighbors, my friends, and my cities. Single-family homes are going to be doomed. And when that happens, part of the spine of a city becomes doomed. 
The progressive case for yimbyism is that rules about what kind of housing is allowed and where fundamentally reinforce economic inequality. Through zoning, you are effectively banned from building anything other than a mansion in Toronto's Bridal Path neighborhood. Some recent citywide reforms make it a little better, but you still can't build apartments. Rich people literally use the power of the government to ban anyone else from living in their neighborhoods. Mansion zoning is the most egregious case, but most cities reserve most land for only single-family detached homes, the most expensive type of housing, limiting apartment buildings, both tall and short, to small sections of the city, often near highways or arterial roads. Treating denser housing as a nuisance that has to be carefully managed leads to housing scarcity, raising prices and putting power in the hands of landlords and home sellers. Additionally, our broken housing system doesn't just hinder private development. Talk to anyone who builds nonprofit or affordable housing, and they'll tell you that low-density zoning, parking requirements, and community opposition are major barriers in their housing work. A new development in Orleans that includes affordable housing units will be delayed because of a parking issue. Some suggesting, though, it's not really about parking, it's about keeping affordable housing out of the neighborhood. Oh, no, I'm not against affordable housing at all. It's just, I think there's other places that would probably be a little bit better. Progressivism gets housing wrong when it rejects incremental progress, in favor of idealism that perpetuates the status quo. The Arizona Senate Democrats spoke out against state-level housing reforms by saying that Housing plans that upend our cities and towns' local control is a non-starter. Our motto cannot be that a $300,000 house is cheaper than a $500,000 house. But that's a really big improvement that would make stable housing accessible for hundreds of thousands more families in Arizona. Perversely, this way of thinking gets even more appealing the more expensive your city is. Who wants to argue that an 8-plex with units starting at $900,000 is the solution to housing affordability? Well, that actually would have been a step in the right direction in West Vancouver. Average home price, $3 million, where that project was rejected with one councillor complaining that the starting price is still out of reach for many. Another progressive mistake is thinking that supporting non-profit housing development should be paired with obstructing for-profit housing construction. There's a pervasive idea that we can just reject market-rate housing because the private market is fundamentally incapable of serving regular people, but that's plainly not true. A townhouse in Edmonton, a fast-growing city with high incomes, averages $260,000 with condos averaging $195,000. To be clear, this does not solve every housing problem or eliminate homelessness, but it's fundamentally more functional for middle and even lower income households compared to high cost cities where housing has gone completely off the rails. The libertarian case for yimbyism is that zoning and land use regulations are some of the most blatant infringements on freedom and property rights in North America. Why does your city government get to dictate how big your lawn is, or prevent you from redeveloping your property into a multiplex or apartment building? What's worse, the economic research is clear that these burdensome land use regulations hinder economic growth by making job markets less efficient. We do become more productive when we are surrounded by a maelstrom of, of economic activity. People for us to work with, to learn from, to sell to, to buy from. Despite their inclusive rhetoric, high-opportunity cities like New York and San Francisco effectively exclude large classes of people from living there through their dysfunctional housing markets. Liberalizing land use regulations might be one of the best policies out there to promote economic mobility. I know of no pathway out of poverty into prosperity that does not run through st city streets. Allowing more compact development patterns is also good for city finances. Forcibly spreading people out inflates cities' infrastructure liabilities. Libertarianism or free market conservatism gets housing wrong when it prioritizes local control rather than freedom. Colorado House Republicans oppose state-level housing reforms to legalize more housing across Colorado, saying that the attack on local control goes against the principles of small government libertarianism. Even though the local governments are the ones enacting onerous regulations, and the state government was trying to legalize more housing. A newly rolled out affordable housing legislation would allow denser development throughout Colorado's biggest cities. Opponents of the legislation, including the Colorado Mun Municipal League, say it steamrolls local control and home rule. The Republican acting mayor of Greenwood Village, Colorado, 
dismiss these state-level reforms as a mandate denying people the right to have a say over who their neighbors are. A scholar from a free enterprise think tank characterized California's state-level efforts to override local control and legalize more housing construction as Soviet-era central planning. There's also a sentiment in many libertarian circles associating cars with freedom, leading some otherwise libertarian-minded people to support rules that mandate and micromanage how much parking needs to be included in new buildings, instead of leaving it up to demand and normal market forces to decide. Thanks for watching through to the end of the video. Special thanks to our supporters on Patreon, 